Hello, this is Martin Wilson welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio Web Seminar. Today's presentation is titled, You Want to Do Histology? Here are the options, brought to you by Gillian Milne. Gillian is a Senior Histology and Application Specialist working in a microscopy and histology facility at the University of Aberdeen. During the presentation, please type any questions you have in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen and we will put them to Gillian at the end. So now, over to Gillian Millen for her presentation. Okay, hello and thank you for tuning in. As Martin says, I work at the Microscopy and Histology Facility at the University of Aberdeen. Here I've been working for 10 years and I'm just going to run through all the procedures that I use, the type of equipment and also what entails working in a multi-user facility. So most important thing is the facility team, of course. Here we have an uh, academic head and i um, also got a manager who runs the show. Myself, along with a microscopy specialist and also the lab technician who just started next year and just learning the ropes and spinning disc and confocal. The most important thing is to make people aware of the facility. So we've got our website on the Aberdeen University web pages. Social networking is also a great way to get out there. So we recently just started a Facebook page. Please join us. We can put up images, try on a weekly basis of what work has been going on. And also this can be found on Twitter as well. And what I haven't mentioned here, how good link LinkedIn is as well, as this is where I found Bite Size Bio. And this is how I'm here today doing this webinar. Multi-user facilities, a few rules of working in this facility. Most importantly is being able to record the samples for this, we have developed a database and um, it's critical to um, record every sample that comes in. So we've developed a database along with the IT crew at the university through Access, as well as inputting all the samples into this database. This is also the way that we bill users as well. For ev every sample that comes through, I ask for a request form to be filled out. On this request form, it mentions how the tissue has been treated before it's come to me, like how it's been fixed, what it's been stored in. All the sample reference is listed as well, and this can be copied into the database. And then they also mention what they want and done with their sample, how they want it processed, number of slides, type of staining, and that sort of thing as well. For the facility, we have developed a welcome pack. This helps with the training of new users, lets them know about what we offer as a facility, how the facility works, and goes over the training procedure that we use as well. We also run courses like a microscopy course where we do um, do our talks quite similar to what I'm going to be doing today along with information sessions about the different microscopes and also practicals to allow people to have a look at the microscopes and a little shot as well. Of course health and safety is vital and um, risk assessments and protocols must be up to date and equipment must be in good condition as well as being able to contact service engineers to keep these up and running, it's also very good to be able to fix problems yourself. So just little things can make a big difference to the quality of results that you're getting. And also, of course, it's important to have a stock of all the reagents and consumables that you may need. Unfortunately, I don't always know what's going to be coming through the facility, so it's good to be ready for anything that might occur. I've got a checklist of things I want to know before I'm actually dealing with the sample. And this is just a few questions that I'll ask the researcher before they come through with our sample. So first of all, of course, I want to know what they're actually going to be looking at. What type of conditions it may require during processing? Is it going to be affected by heat? Is it better to do it at low temperature? Is there a specific procedure that's required? Um, different tissue can react differently. There might be extra steps that you need to add to a protocol or steps that you may need to take out as it could damage the tissue. Of course, you need to make sure the right equipment is available. There's simple things as well, like thickness of section. You need to think about how you're going to get the best morphology and how it's going to look on the slide at the end of the day. And once they want to, you need to look at your tissue, what you want to see from your tissue, what you want the stain to show up. So there's a lot of options out there. A few that I'll go over today. And also, you need to think about if you're going to be doing any immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence, as there's certain ways that your tissue needs to be treated in order to allow this to work successfully. Okay, so once you've worked out what you're actually going to do with a sample, you need to take a look at what equipment is available to help. And not all this equipment is essential, but it definitely makes a lot of difference if they are available. So processors allow the automation of the processing, which is great, because while your tissue is processing away, you're able to get on with other work that you need to do. An embedding sensor as well is um, critical for wax processing. 
um, microtomes, different um, variety of microtomes that are available for different types of embedded tissue, whether it's resin or wax or frozen tissue. Stainers, not essential, but um, if you have have one, if you're lucky enough to have one, this will save a bit of time and good for repeatable results. But they're not essential, as you'll see further on in this um, webinar. Cover slipper, again, a bit of a luxury, but something that's really helpful in your everyday work. And then, of course, once you've um, embedded your tissue section, it's stained it, you want to know how you're going to look at the sample, what kind of microscope you're going to need. And also, a microscope is very useful at the start as well, because if you're wanting to dissect your tissue, you want to be able to see what area you're looking at. So, first step, fixation. This is the most important step, and your tissue needs to be fixed immediately from fresh. This is essential for the preservation of sample morphology, the prevention of autolysis. So your correct fixation technique is critical. You want to get your optimum preservation, and so you've got the best morphology at the end, and also this allows for the successful staining of tissue. If you use the wrong kind of staining, you may not be able to get the, the type of staining results that you require. So I've actually got an image of a transmission electron micrograph and this was a good example of bad fixation. It's not always that apparent at light microscopy level, but once you actually look under the electron microscope, you can see the difference of the damage of the cells that you've got there. So on the right-hand side here, I've got an example of good morph um, morphology at electron microscopy level, where you can see all the cell components easily. So chemical fixation, this is what I do the majority of the time, because I'm working mostly with wax and resin processing process samples. And I'm using formaldehyde for um, good and fast tissue penetration. Um, this will give good morphology as well at the light microscopy level. And it's also good for preserving um, epitopes, which is essential for when you're doing immunohistochemistry. Another option which gives even better morphology and good for ultrastructural work is glutaraldehyde. It's got slower tissue presentation but it does not conserve your epitopes very well, so not good for immunohistochemistry. And this I would use mostly in electron microscopy. Now this is taken from Bancroft et al. Theory and practice of histological techniques, and this is a fantastic reference book for anyone that's wanting to work in histology. It's got all the information you require for all the different processing techniques, different tissues that you're going to be using, cell preps, and staining, amino work, it's a really great book to have if you're thinking about doing histology. So when it comes to processing, this is the processor I've got for my wax samples. I've had it for the whole time that I've worked in the histology lab, and it's quite a basic machine, but it does the work that I want it to do. So this is an automated machine. It allows me to put the programs in that I require. It's got um, large tubs for me to put my reagents in, which are easily changed if required. And then at the end of the, the process, it takes it into molten wax. So as I say, this is quite a basic model, but you can also get a vacuum pack to go along with it. Or there is also a um, larger processor, quite similar to this one, available that will take more samples. So to keep your reagents nice and fresh, it's um, essential to rotate your, sam your reagents. Or um, refresh. I tend to refresh them kind of on a rule every third run. But as I'm not... This machine is not constantly in use, so we've got to be careful for evaporation and make sure there's enough reagent in there so the sample doesn't dry out as it's going through the run. So your samples of varying size can go into cassettes. This is just an example of the cassettes that I've got in my lab just now that allows me to process tissue of all shapes and sizes. The one on the left is a small mesh, which may be not visible on this image, but it's the smallest mesh that I have to allow really small um, tissue prep. I've got our deeper mould. We've got a chamber one again for smaller tissue and just the standard one on the right hand side. And there's lots of different shapes and colours available for you to choose. So processing automation, of course, as I say, it saves time, allows you to do other work while your tissue is going around. Although um, automation is the preferred option, of course, some of the samples that you're going to be working with are going to be quite difficult and actually it's better to do these manually. Some of the difficult tissues that I've been working with include cell pellets that are really tiny and barely, barely visible. So sometimes I find this better to put it into an agar prep. So just using low melting point agar and this will just keep the cells together and you can actually, at least then you can see the agar through the whole processing cycle. 
I find wax process and quite a simple process. Now, once you know your your timings and what works best with all the different tissues, some problems can occur. And in the past, the, the worst problem we've had is contamination of our ethanol, which meant that the tissue didn't dehydrate properly. And when it came to the embedding, the tissue wouldn't stay in the wax block because the wax hadn't infiltrated properly. And one of the ways we've overcome this problem is by adding calcium carbonate to um, ethanol and the cleaning agents to make sure the water is taken out. So this is my basic wax protocol. Um, it's kind of a standard protocol, as you see, it's used by the majority of people. And as I say, the times can be adjusted and it's to suit the, diff suit the different types of tissue. So for smaller tissue, you may reduce times of your standard protocol. Or for fatty tissues, you may need to extend this protocol. Additional hydration steps can be added and also some labs use histoclear as an alternative to xylene. I'm working with quite a few different, a lot of different um, tissue types and a couple of them can be quite difficult to work with and this includes mouse size for when you're processing to wax because of course the lens is very solid and this makes it difficult to section. So one way of overcome this is by adding phenol to low concentration of alcohol and also when it comes to section calcified tissue, it, again it needs to be decalcified before processing to allow good section and quality afterwards. And this is the setup I've got in my lab for my embedding. So it, it's got the molten wax bath which allows you to just push the tap and allow the molten wax comes out and I use uh, the bottom middle picture shows the moulds that I use with molten wax. I then use heated forceps. Again this is a really good thing to have and then you orientate your tissue. Once you've orientated your tissue, you then cool the wax. You add the cassette with the lid off and then fill it up and then you've got a nice wax block like on the right hand side there and that's then ready to, for sectioning. But what, once you've orientated and cooled it on the cold plate and then they're ready to section. So for the paraffin sectioning, this is one of my basic kind of wax mic tool and there's different ones available but they all do the same job. Of course is a section you're able to vary the section thickness. You've got the block holder which you can adjust as required so you get the right orientation and the right angle of the block. And there's a blade holder which can be adjusted. So this is my the blocks I was working on yesterday and I just have them sitting on a nice um, ice block to allow them to cool, a nice wet cool ice block. And this helps with the sectioning. So when you're doing paraffin section, we use the Superfrost Plus slides. This, we find, gives the best section adherence. We dry them up like right first on a hot plate, and this is before we put them into a 37 degree oven overnight to fully dry. If they're not dry properly and there's any water left behind the section, this will cause damage to your section. Once we've, they're completely dry, they're not going to be stained straight away. You can allow them to cool and they're easily stored. So I find the best way and probably cost effective way to do it is just to hold on to my old slide boxes and the slides can be sat in there without any problem of the sections coming off. And then once we're ready to stain, it's essential to remove the wax, otherwise the stain won't penetrate. So I do this by first melting the wax in the 60 degree oven and then into xylene for a couple of steps to de-wax. Again, histoclear can be used here as an alternative. Before staining, it's important to do the rehydration and then you can do your stain. And now we're on to the resin processing side of things. So I do quite a lot of work with this, both at light microscopy and electron microscopy level. The two light microscopy resins I use are acrylic resins, glycomethacrylate and methylmethacrylate. And this is the resin processor that I have got, the Leica ENTP. Again, it's all programmable. There takes up to 100 programs if I don't know if anyone's actually doing that many programs but the options there if they want to and I use this to say for the acrylic resins as well as all of white and the epoxy resins tab 812 and spurs for electron microscopy so this is fully automated it allows you to process varying sizes of tissue and then in the processor itself as it's going around the program its agitation can be set up and also you can do this at a lower temperature you can actually cool the vials as they're going around as well. So if I'm doing the electron microscopy setup, it just means it's smaller vials and it just takes the one single rod. I can take maybe about 20 samples. So you can have 24 steps in your program. For the light microscopy side of things, it takes just 12 vials, but you can put more samples in as it's a triple rod. 
so they can take for like even for like say the mouse eyes which are slightly bigger than some of the smaller tissues I'll be working with you can get about 40 eyes in the processor at a time. So as I keep going about mouse eyes because this has been a big part of my work for a long time I'm going to go over the procedure that I use for this tissue as we fix them in 2.5% glutaraldehyde and phosphate buffer. This is because researchers are actually grading the disease of the eye and they want them the best morphology possible to enable them to do this and the resin works really well and of course because the resin is solid unlike the wax there's no softening of the phenol um, required. So again this is my basic schedule that I'll use 70% ethanol, 95% ethanol, 100% and then gradual inf infiltration of the resin. Once they've finished the program, the eyes can then be sliced and what I do is replace them back in the GMA. This allows the infiltration of the resin and from the slice it'll, I can then get the right orientation of the sample. This is just a quick look of the embedding technique that I use. So I mix up the solutions of the glycomethacrylate and then place the solution in the plastic embedding mould and then orientate the sample. It's a really quick procedure, so you have to make sure your samples are in before it starts polymerizing. As well as putting the eye in the, the mold, also have a label with a number. So this number is what has been generated by my database. So each one has its own unique number. And the, just write it on a bit of paper to put in with the resin, and therefore it's easy to read what sample it is. Just put the stuff on top and leave it for an hour, and they're just sitting in ice cold water. So I quite like using this resin because it's easy, simple, and gives me little problems and it gives really good results. And with this resin, we just no removal is required and we stain it from there. On to the next resin that I use, methyl methacrylate. This is a harder resin than GMA and more difficult to work with. And I'm also using it for more difficult types of samples as well. So when it's polymerizing, it's a bit more tricky and air has to be eliminated from it. And there's two different techniques that can be used, one with using an accelerator, another one in 40 degree oven overnight. So as I say, I'm using this for more difficult, harder tissue, like non-decalcified bone. And with this tissue, I am fixing it in the 4% phosphate buffer formaldehyde, as this um, resin can actually be used for the trap staining. So we need to be able to remove the resin for this. And again, as with other techniques, the processing schedule is very similar. With this, we find it needs a longer time frame, and we're also doing it at four degrees to try and preserve the tissue. And this is what I use to embed. This is a procedure without the accelerator. And again, we're starting with a liquid resin, popping the tissue in and orientating it, sealing it from air, and putting it in the oven overnight. Once the re resin has polymerized, we then use the Technovit 30, 40, and then we place the block holder on top of the polymerized block and fill with this 30, 40 resin to allow it to pop out. And then the accelerator method is done pretty much exactly the same way as I showed you there with the GMA, but we need to seal it off, so we have to use molten wax to do this. This microtome is what I use to section the resin, and it's, again, microtomes are all quite similar, so it's the same ideas, but this is motor, motorized, and also has a light source with binocular heads for the more difficult samples that I work with. But because it's motorized, it's got a control panel where you change the speeds, the thickness, an advanced sample. There's also a block holder which takes the different types of blocks depending on the way I prepare the tissue and also a knife holder which takes all the different types of knives that may be required. The different knives that are available is um, we've got glass knives and the way we make these is by strips of glass and then this image here is of my knife maker. So from the strips of glass we then cut down it into squares and then into triangles and we have a nice sharp edge on the triangle. These are good for sectioning in the GMA where we it needs to be sectioned dry. For the MMA and the epoxy resins, we have to section them wet. So it can it work for that as well, but not getting the best quality of sections off. That's where we would start to use, maybe think about using a diamond knife, especially if we're wanting thin sections. So these have to be used wet, otherwise the knife will become damaged. So we use this for sectioning in MMA and epoxy resins. And as I say, it has to be thin sections only. So we're talking about maybe up to two microns. After that, we start to use a large tungsten carbide blade, which is a big solid blade, but really good for cutting the hard tissue that I'm working with. And this is the setup for the methyl methacrylate, showing the tungsten carbide blade. And these, again, are a bit more complex to try and get good sections off of it. We find we need to press these sections once they're taken off the side. So we're sectioning them wet, popping them into a water bath at about 
40 degrees and then onto the slide and then from there we press them we have our own little side press to use and then pop them in the oven overnight to dry and removing the resin before any staining using methyl methoxyethyl acetate or MIA and then again just like the wax silene and rehydration before staining frozen samples so there's two advantages to this and that's um, no fixation is required and also the time that it takes to prepare the sample is very quick so this is really good if you've got fresh tissue you need to freeze it straight away to get the best results and then from there you can section it get onto your slide just allow it to dry briefly it doesn't need too long and then it's available and um, ready to do staining so this is really good for a diagnostic side of things or getting just really quick results and you can see your tissue and also for immunohistochemistry as well, especially if you're using a new antibody and you don't know how it's going to be affected by chemical fixation or any chemicals that are involved in the processing schedule. This is the cryostat that I use in my lab and um, it works down to minus 30. So again, you have to work out what works best for your different tissues. And within this cryostat, they're kept cold. So it allows for good sectioning without your block going soft and preserving your tissue. Of course, there's always a negative and you've got to be really careful when you're freezing your tissue. We do it by freezing isopentane in liquid nitrogen and then freezing the tissue in OCT, uh, sucrose protectant. So it freezes more slowly in the isopentane than it would when it's straight into liquid nitrogen, which can cause cracking of your sample as well. Another negative is fatty tissues are very difficult to section. So with all these different types of sectioning, there some problems that may occur along the way. So I've just got a few um, troubleshooting issues here to go over how it's easy to sort it out. So when you're sectioning you might find your tissue starts tearing. If it's wax that you're sectioning you may find that your block needs to be cooled and that's either sitting on the, the wet ice block or using an ice cube on the block face. There also may be damage to your blade anytime. I'm sure everyone who's ever done any histology has what every now and then you get your first step right off the blade edge and you've ruined your blade, have to change it over. They're really delicate. They can easily be chipped or there's something in the sample that's causing the problem. What we do in the facility is always make sure people start on the left hand side of the blade. So you always know as you're working your way to the right that there's a good fresh area of blade to use. It's quite possible to get an even sectioning as well. The first thing to check about this is make sure everything's tight in the microtome. So it could be the blade just not being held in position properly, either it's, it's not secure itself or the whole blade holder is maybe loose. Maybe your block's not in there tight either. Sometimes um, wax is a bit more forgiving if you accidentally take a little chunk out, you can melt it down and re-embed it. But when it comes to resin, if something loose is, is loose in your microtome and you can completely break your block and yeah, you don't want to be in that position. And if you're not getting any sections at all, sometimes this could be the block holder and your microtomes come out too far. Or if the blade's not at the correct angle. I find this particularly with a um, wax microtome because ours are multi-user and different people are coming in to use it. I've had it, the problem a few times when after cleaning they've loosened the, the blade and it's gone down to the wrong angle. So when the next person comes in, they're not getting any sections at all. And it's always a relief to know the reason is because the knife angle's been changed. Also, Sometimes if you've gone too far over on the blade and the block holder is actually hitting off the, the blade holder and this is just causing that slight movement that means you're not getting any sections off. So they're quite simple things that can be easily rectified. Just need to work through your checklist to see what the problem is. Right, we're on to staining. So as I said, some people might be lucky enough to have their own automated stainer, but this is my staining setup that I've had and it hasn't been changed because it works really well. I think if I got a bigger lab, maybe then I could fit a automated stainer in, but that's uh, another topic. So as I said before, resin and paraffin needs to be removed before you're doing the sectioning. Um, of course, rehydration. And I've got my hematoxin, acid alcohol, lithium carbonate and eosin all set up here. So this is h &E is the most widely used stain. That's why it's permanently set up in my lab. I get lots of different people coming in just to even use staining in my lab. So it's a really handy setup to have and easy to do. And after you're staining, you can do you need to do dehydration and um, clearing of the slides before you can cover slip. Probably one of my favourite bits of equipment because it makes my life so much easier is a cover slipper. So this is really good if you um, you're in a busy histology lab and you could have hundreds of slides to cover slip at one time. 
it saves you a lot of time and also you get really nice cover slipping with no air bubbles. I'd like to say no air bubbles. You maybe got the odd air bubble, but definitely not as much as you would when you're doing it manually. So there's different types of mountains you would use as well. But the majority of the time I'm using a resinous mountain for the light microscopy. But when it comes to fluorescence, you need to think about how you're going to preserve your fluorescence. And this is examples of work that come through my lab. And this is the resin embedded mouse eyes. So they're looking at the retina there. And it's hematoxin, ease, and staining. I really like the quality of morphology you get from this type of preparation. This is wax pre prepared samples. And as well as the um, hematoxin easing, I'll see in blue has also been used along with this stain to um, enhance the goblet cells. And this is just a bit of trout liver. Saffron and oil and fast green is a stain that's being used a lot at the moment because we're doing a lot of bone and cartilage work. So a majority of these stains, I'll just have powders from which the stains can be made up from. Toluidine blue, I just spotted earlier actually, there's a really good article on um, Bite Size Bio about the toluidine blue and I use this mostly just for a, a quick morphology check as I'm sectioning through samples, particularly resin and a lot with electron microscopy work. It's really good for finding your correct area, so if you know you need to trim into a certain area, you can just pick up your section, dry it quickly, stain it for about 30 seconds with your toluidine blue and you know exactly where you are within that section. So it's really handy for that perspective, but also for staining mast cells if you're looking for any disease as well. Mast and trichrome, one of my favourites, because I just like the colours in this one. I just buy it in a kit. It can be made up yourself, but if you get a nice reliable kit, it's worth investing in it. Again, as I keep saying, do a lot of bone work. This is the calcified bone cut with resin, and we use the silver nitrate to stain the calcium. So that's showing up with the black and a quick paragon stain, which is really good for showing up different cell components. For example, in the bone, the osteoid stains up nice and pink, for, so it's good for measuring the level of osteoid in these kind of samples. Paragon is also quite like toluidine blue. It's a really quick stain to use, and that could be used for just a quick morphology check or check of the area of your sample. And this is one of the samples I'm particularly proud of. I was speaking earlier on about cells that I've been working with, which you can barely see when you're processing. By the time you get the block, you definitely can't see them until you section them. And then you can stain on the slide and then you can see you've got your cells there. So this is pancreatic islet cells that um, somebody has done fluorescence, fluorescence on. And I really like these images, they look really nice. And again, there's um, problems that may occur with your staining. So you might get patchy staining. This could be due to the paraffin or resin not being completely removed. Pale or dark staining, have you got your timings right? Depending on the thickness of the tissue, the way you prepare the tissue, the type of tissue, you may have to alter your timings to get the, the optimum staining for these tissues. With the likes of hematoxin easing, you require to do differentiation step. So if you haven't blued in the lithium carbonate, maybe you're Hematoxin will turn out to pale, kind of red colour rather than the nice blue that you're after. Contamination of the stain, it's really important to do the rinses that are required so you're not bringing one step onto the next. This can affect the quality of the stain that you're going to get. And as I say, the rinsing is essential for preventing contamination. So you get precipitation on the slide. If you can see, it's come from your stain. Some stains mean it's filtered before use or otherwise if it's just dirty stain may want to refresh the, the solution. And also you might, after you're staining and you dehydrated and you cleared in the xylene, if you haven't removed all the water or there's anything left on the slide or bits of wax or anything or your xylene's not clean, this will show up after your cover's slipping. Just like little globules or air bubbles underneath the cover slip. So the suggestion would be to make sure you clean out your reagents, check them before use and make sure they're ready to go. Also within the facility, I've got automated immunohistochemistry, but I'm not going to get into immunohistochemistry because I know that Mike's got his webinar tomorrow. So it's just to show another bit of equipment that we've got in the lab, another thing that's automated and saves time. So as I say, it's not just me in the facility, we've got all the different types of microscopes as well. So once I've done my work in histology, quite often these microscopes come into use. So like microscopy, we've got upright and inverted microscopes. We also have the EVO system, um, if you haven't come across that, that's a nice quick way of getting simple images without having to use a computer and get to grips with the software. 
different types of fluorescence microscopy as well, including live cell imaging. And just recently, we've got a slide scanner, and this is a fantastic bit of equipment. And again, as I keep repeating myself, it's all about time saving and automation, but this is a really great bit of equipment, which will save hours of time sitting at a microscope in the dark. We can just um, set up the scanner to take different types of slides and um, just leave it on its way. Also, confocal microscopy is available. We've got different types of um, confocals as well as spinning disc. And then we also do electron microscopy. So we do transmission electron microscopy. I've mentioned how I do a lot of resin work for electron microscopy in the processor. But another way of also doing it is without the chemical fixation is high pressure freezer and also a free substitution unit. And then we can view the samples in our new um, Joel 1400 plus microscope. And this also has tomography capabilities. And then we also have our scanning electron microscope as well. And the last but not least, um, laser microdeception pan system was also available. So thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch, please feel free to get in touch. As I say, we've got our Facebook page. We're on the university website, along with other facilities that are available. And I've just popped some of my useful references that I've used within this webinar and also some websites that I use. And I should have added Bite Size Bio in there, but you probably all know how good the articles are that they produce and how much I, I learn a lot of little tips from that as well. Really good. So thank you, and thank you to Bite Size Bio for inviting me to do this webinar. Thanks, Gillian. That was a um, great presentation. I'm sure our audience found it very useful. I really liked your staining setup. Um, looks pretty yeah. tried and trusted. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's well used. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very well used. Um, I've got a few questions here. Um, so we'll just start with the first one. What's a good method to decalcify bone and what's the optimum thickness to cut bone sections? There's different methods for decalcifying bone. The majority of people go for the EDTA method. This is quite can be quite a long method depending say on the size of the tissue that you're working with. But if the likes of a, a mouse tibia or something you could be looking at two to three weeks and you have to regularly change the EDTA as well. And there's also, there's, this is called a decalcifying solution light, and this can be done within hours. So again, it's, it's weighing up whether you're still getting the best results from using what solution works best for your tissue, and if you're going to be doing likes of immuno work if it's affecting any of the, the antigens in your sample. So when it comes to sectioning, if you're talking about the decalcified wax, sections, we tend to be cutting at 5 microns, just for that suits what the, the people are working with. So yeah, it's standard 5 yeah. microns. Yeah. Um, next question, what's the difference between formaldehyde and acetone for fixation, please? Acetone fixation could be quite harsh on your sample. It's not something I really worked with, but there's plenty of references out there. It can make your tissue quite hard and brittle. It's a different type of fixation, whereas you've got your cross-linking um, formaldehyde fixation, which is slower and just, I feel, gives better morphology. But yeah. I've seen an article in Bite Size Bio again about this, so mm -hmm. please refer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, I used to use, <laughs> I've, I've used methanol in the past for, um, for fixation, but um, I was always aware that using solvents can strip um, cell receptors, cell surface receptors, mm -hmm. apparently. So try to stick with um, formaldehyde. Next question is, um, can you uh, suggest a good company to buy cassettes from? Because in one of your pictures you had cassettes with very small meshes and this person used to buy them from Histolab but they're not producing them anymore. Oh, the, the ones with the really small meshes I've been getting from Cellpath. And do you buy most of your cassettes from Cellpath? VWR have a good collection as well as... Um, ah, yeah. Yeah, Cellpath and VWR are the ones I tend to go to. Next question is, how do you refresh the reagents in your tissue processor? Do you add more or replace part of the volume or do you just replace, is there a certain period of time you replace the whole lot? For the likes of the ethanol and the xylene chloroform step, I have three reagent containers so I rotate them. So after about three runs I will rotate it so always making sure that last step is clean. Obviously, keep an eye on your reagents, and if they're looking dirty or anything, change them straight away. Sure. And um, probably about every, I say about every third run, if it, if it's looking okay, for maybe 
three to five runs, I think, and then give them a, a re complete refresh. The next question is, um, have you used Testaclear before, and do you find that it performs similarly to Xylene? The only reason I've used Testaclear is because somebody came to me and they had a protocol from somewhere else they required to follow. I would like to try and test this out a bit more, just if I can find the time, but it's something I want to look into. But no, I, I can't really say if I've, I haven't yet had the time to find out if any tissue really reacts differently to the Testaclear compared to the Xylene. I've got a pretty specific question. I don't know if you'll be able to... <laughs> um, <laughs> this person's been... Um, they want to know how to prevent a false lipofusion staining in aged rat brain fixed with 4% PFM and embedded in OCT. Um, they've tried Sudom Black but with no luck. Have you ever done that? No, not experiencing no, that either. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's pretty specific. Or maybe somebody else out there will have... I don't know. This, um, <laughs> they might know. This um, Histonet... Quite a good ah, one yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Searching, great. For, searching for um, people's replies or putting your own question out there. Yeah. It's got a lot of information. Or I, I could actually, um, if the person's still listening, um, you could um, post the question up to Bite Size Bio, to the Bite Size Bio page or to the Facebook page, and um, we might be able to find the answer for you. Two more questions. Do you know any special staining for proteins? Proteins, depend what type mm. of proteins you're after. Yeah. The final question is, um, I'm not sure how often you use cell culture samples, but maybe you have an answer. Uh, when working with adherent cells, how do you deal with the fixing and washing of the cells that die during the treatment and they may de-adhere from a substrate? Yeah, I, I don't work with cells so much like that. <laughs> so um... I, I actually, on reading that question, there's, um, there's a couple of good articles that um, Jen Reddick has written on Bite Size Bio just now and she's looking at adherent and um, suspension cells and preps for histology so um, I would refer that person to the Bite Size Bio articles. Okay, that's um, the end of the questions and brings us to the end of the seminar. So thanks again Julian, that was an excellent presentation, really enjoyed it. Thanks. And last but by no means least, a big thank you to your audience for taking the time to attend today. If you have enjoyed the seminar and would like to view the video recording of the session, please visit the seminars page on bitesizebio.com. It should be available within the next 24 hours. There you can also check out our upcoming webinars. And just a reminder that tomorrow afternoon, 1700 GMT, we have a webinar with Mike Miller on um, immunohistochemistry. So, until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Bite Size Bio.